Good morning. Praise the Lord. On behalf of the family I'm serving as program director and we want to welcome everyone and express thanks from the family and gratefulness for your presence here in honoring and celebrating the life of John L. McClellan Sr. Sunrise, August 4th, 1929, and sunset, March 9th, 2024. The order of service will continue as written on the program. Scripture, Elder Glenn Smith. Prayer, Elder Anita Hampton. Song, Choir, and then Tributes. Praise the Lord. This is um, an occasion that we all go through at some point in life. I've been through it with my mom, my dad, so I know how Elder John feels and the experience is there, but it's necessary. I was looking at, I was asking God yesterday, <clears throat> what can I read uh, so far as a scripture that would be appropriate for this occasion? And he took me to the book of John, the fourth chapter. Now, our subject today is Brother John McClellan, Sr. and Jr. So that's John. I said, okay, God, what, what, I, I know what the 14th chapter says, but in reading it, it had a whole new meaning for me. So I'm going to read uh, some of those verses from uh, John, the 14th chapter. And you can imagine Jesus, when he was talking with his disciples, he was preparing them for what was to come. So he started with, do not let your heart be troubled or distressed or agitated. You believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on God. Believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I am going away to prepare a place for you. And to the place where I'm going, you know the way. Jesus said to him, and this was talking to Thomas, one of the, one of the disciples, said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by and through me. And then I dropped down to the next thing where he said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the very works themselves. If you cannot trust me, at least let these works that I do in my Father's name convince you. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, he will himself be able to do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby, that he may remain with you forever. And then he said, I will not leave you comfortless as orphans, desolate, bereaved, forlorn, helpless. I will come back to you. 
just a little while now and the world will and the world would not see me anymore but you will see me because I live you will also live and that time excuse me and that time when that day comes you will know for yourselves that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you Then he goes on to say, peace, I live with you. I leave with you. My own peace now I give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you really love me, you would have been glad because I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater and mightier than I am. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does take place, you may believe and have faith in and rely on me. So these are the words that Jesus was proclaiming prior to his death because he knew that we would go through these things and we would be focused on the death that was coming. But he said he has overcome all of that and even for the family and I say this because I've gone through this and I know where you are and I knew Mr. McClellan uh, you know I met him through John every time I saw him he was busy. He was moving. He, he was not standing still. He was always moving. I said, this man has a lot of vitality, but he knew what was in him. And I know today with family and things that have gone on and he's gone on and we're losing a loved one. And I remember the scripture that God says, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. And to me, I take that as that what's in you is greater than what's on you. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. This is a blessed morning. We're here to acknowledge our loved one that has gone on. But today is a blessed day. Just looking at you, it makes no difference number-wise what it is. We know what God has in store for the rest of us. We just want to offer a word of prayer for the family of encouragement at this time. Lord, we thank you just because of who you are. Lord, we thank you that you've blessed us to come this far and to see so many blessings in our lives. This family has gone through some things, but God, you've always been there for them. God, you are the keeper, the maker. You're there all in all. We pray your blessings upon them, God, that none should perish. But if they perish, they perish in you. Lord, we thank you that you've done a work. Lord, we thank you that that work is a continuous work, even in us, as we portray ourselves for what you are. Lord, we ask you to comfort, to keep, and to protect the family, Lord, in this time. We know, God, that your mercy endureth forever and ever and ever. And we praise you for it, Lord. We thank you, Lord, of these beautiful people, Lord, that are right here in your presence, God. And those that could not make it, Lord, we extend this prayer to them. We thank you, Lord, that even though this day has to come and we too shall see it, we just thank you, Lord, that the life that Mr. John has led, Lord, has been a blessing. He endured, he enjoyed his life, Lord, and at his time of going, by him being your child, God, we thank you, Lord, that he acknowledged that it's your will and not his. We praise you, Lord, for love, for grace, and for peace in the family, Lord. Togetherness, Lord, regardless of circumstances, 
regardless of what they go through, God, let them be a help to one another. We praise you, Lord, for those things are the things that you instill in us. And those are the things that we want to be just like you, God. The love, the mercy, the caring, the sharing, everything that we need, God, is in you. We praise you for it, Lord. We give you glory right now in the presence of you, God, because your presence is evident here, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for those things that you're about to do, those things that you have done. We give you glory. We give you honor, Lord, as we proceed, Lord. In Jesus' name, we praise you right now. Amen.
to invite family and friends to share any tribute to in honor of John L. McClellan Sr. And we do ask that those tributes or expressions be limited to three minutes, please. So we invite you to come at this time. Good morning, everybody. I wanted to say to my cousins that I counted a privilege to be able to share a few things about him. Uh, John L., as we called him, was my mother's first cousin. He was present in our lives when we were younger. We, uh, my brother reminded me last night that he liked coconut cake. My mom used to always make coconut cakes, and he loved coconut cakes. I don't know if you all knew that or not, but um, I learned a lot from him in my young days. When he would come home and he would visit us, he would often tell me stories or incidents that happened to him when he was in, military, in the military. And he actually shared to me stories of when he was injured and some of the things that he went through. I didn't understand it all at the time because I was young. But as I grew, I really appreciate him and the sacrifice that he gave for us as a country to be able to enjoy freedom. Um, the one thing that I really, in the recent years, the one thing that I really, really appreciate him for is because he knew that I was the family history person. And his daughter-in-law, uh, I called him and she met me at his house and we had a long talk. We thought it was going to be maybe an hour. It ended up being hours. But he shared with me a picture of my parents that he took on one of his visits home. And I think the picture had to be like late 51 or early 52 because my dad was a young man. And he was holding me. And I was not a year old yet. And I was born in 1951. So it had to be 51 or early 52. Uh, and then the final thing that I want to share is just his organization and his attention to detail. Because when I visited him the last time, um, he gave me, he had it all stapled, all numbered, but a um, listing of his family, the McClellan family history, starting with our great-grandfather, his wife, and all of the kids. He was very detailed. He gave me the year that they were born, the year that they died, and then he gave me information on some of the other family members. And that uh, went a long way with me as I continued to research our family. I can't say, John, and the, everybody else how you feel, but I can say that I've been there. And um, so if you ever need to talk, if you ever need anything, I'm just a phone call away, actually. And I just wanted to, let me see, just leave these parting words with you. May you find hope and glimmers of light that guide you forward. May the love and support of those around you provide comfort in these trying times. Are there others? If so, would you come now? Amen. Have a couple of tributes uh, from the family. The first one that I'll read is from a daughter in law. It says, Father in law, 
I came into your family not knowing what I'd find. I was nervous and afraid, but you gently eased my mind. You made me feel right at home from the first day that we met. You welcomed me with open arms, and that I won't forget. You always have encouraged me with kind words of wisdom that you would say. I knew I could depend on you on any given day. You were a great father-in-law. You stood out above the rest. I thank God for blessing me with you the very best. Until we meet again, you're a daughter-in-law to Juana T. The second one that I will read is from his daughter. And on behalf of Martha McLean Morehouse, giving honor to Pastor Steve, my brother's church family, our family, visitors, and friends. There are four words shared with me between me and my daddy on Monday, March 4th, 2024, that mended every broken fence. He awakened from his slumber, his dreams, and perhaps another good conversation with God, and saw me sitting in a chair at the foot of the hospital bed. He said, hi, baby. And I replied, hi, daddy. He has said, and he has said, I love you to us, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, extended family, and friends. I believe we may have missed some of those I love yous, and I'm proud of you, and I forgive you, and please forgive me. And the genuine curiosity about our lives and so much more. But on this day, as we honor and celebrate the life of John L. McClellan Sr., let us remember that expressions of love and grace are sometimes explicit and sometimes subtle. Thank you, Daddy. We love you. And that is from Martha McClellan Morehouse. Now we have acknowledgments at this time, and I will read one of the many cards that have been sent to the family. Those we hold, those we hold in our hearts never truly leave us. They live on in the kindness they showed, the comfort they shared, and the love they brought into our lives, thinking of you at this sad time. That is from Elder Ellis and Rosa Wilson. We also want to acknowledge at this time on behalf of the family, their expressions. Our family wishes to express gratitude for your prayers, expressions of love, and concern as we navigate this time of bereavement. We appreciate you and may your blessings be abundant. We will continue with the order of the program. The reflections in your program that's been written will be read silently at this time, followed by a song by the choir praise team, then the eulogy by the elder John McClellan. 
the closing song and benediction, choir, and Pastor Steve.
him to look at my subject and pick some songs and <sighs> my god man <laughs> thank you for that that really hit the mark of what I was looking for <clears throat> thank you each for coming um, today on this occasion to celebrate with us Amen. to celebrate Amen. with us um To my pastor in her absence, Pastor Jennifer, to Pastor Steve and um, other ministers on the dais with me, and um, to my family, church members, visitors, and friends, I want to share from my heart what I see is the word um, that God ministered to me in the occasion of my dad's death. But before I give you the title of my message, I'm gonna, um, if anybody brought a Bible, um, ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10, and let's figure out this title. <coughs> In Matthew chapter 10, as you're turning, um, you may have it on your smart devices. You know, you may not have a book, but um, a way that you can look it up, you might have. It might be on your smart device. In chapter 10 of Matthew, uh, you're going to see that Jesus is taking his 12 disciples and giving them instructions, and he sends them forth to preach. But the verse I want you to look at when you get there is verse 6, where we're looking for a two-letter imperative command word. <coughs> And the verse says this, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's all it says. And though the verse five has this word that we're looking for, the real word, word that I want us to find is the word go. He said, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's talking to his 12 disciples and telling them that. And verse five is telling them where not to go. So I'm using verse 6 from Matthew chapter 10. Now, in Luke chapter 10, if you look over there, you're looking for that same two-letter word. It's the first word in verse 3 of Luke chapter 10. And it says, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And it says a little bit more in that verse also. Um, then down in verse 10, it said, if they're rejected, he tells them, go your ways into the streets. And he says to shake the dust of that city off your feet. Now, I didn't tell you to turn to this one, but this is very familiar. Luke chapter, I'm excuse me, Matthew 28, 19 is the Great Commission verses. If you look there, you're going to see that same two-letter word. Matthew 28, 19. 
it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then it goes on to say some other things in verse, um, in the next verse. The verses in Matthew 10 and Luke chapter 10 were spoken during Jesus' earthly ministry. But the verses in Matthew 28 were spoken after Jesus had died and risen from the dead. Now, we're hearing more about Matthew 28 than, uh, you may be seated, than um, Matthew 10 and Luke 10. But in the difference is in Matthew, um, the command in Matthew 28 is not the first time Jesus told him to go. I just showed you two places in scripture, Matthew 10, which was before that, and Luke 10, which is before that. So Jesus was telling them in Matthew 28 and in Matthew 10 and Luke 10, he was telling them that though he would not physically be traveling with them now that he has risen from the dead and he's going back to heaven, when they go this time, he wants them to keep going. That's the title of my message, keep going. In the message, Keep Going, I want to say some things about a man who left some good principles for his family to use. Now, I'm not up here to paint halos on my dad because neither he was perfect nor am I. But his life reflected some good things and examples that we should try to maintain and pass on. And uh, Kayla, I'm not picking on you. <laughs> You're just the only uh, granddaughter that's here. But um, it's gonna, this is going to be recorded, so um, John will get this too. <clears throat> Building a legacy means that you make an impact on future generations by leaving them wisdom, wealth, or some other influence that makes a difference long after you're gone. Spiritual legacy is a foundation that strengthens our faith, helps us navigate life's challenges, and guides future generations in their walk with God. Here are some examples that my dad practiced that I want to share with the congregation, future generations of McClellans, and, um, and anybody that wants to adopt them. They're just wise principles that I want to share with you. And it's only five of them. Number one. Dad got up in the morning, he would sit at his dining room table and pray and read passages from the Bible before beginning his day. I'm sure this room is filled with people that do exactly that. Nothing foreign, nothing different. He also took magic markers and made signs containing scriptures that he would put, on, um, put out in his yard. He had a wire rack that he would stand up in the yard, Royal racks and he would put those scriptures on uh, racks in his yard. Now, people may have thought he was weird for doing that, but he was just willing to be a witness for Christ and to the souls that were around him. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and to salvation to everyone that believes. So I give that to anyone who would like to continue those practices as being a way that you would want to express your... Um, relationship with God. Number two, dad was determined to work. You say, well, everybody is. Not necessarily. Because of his disability, he couldn't work the jobs, normal jobs that most jobs were, companies would provide. So um, he had to move to cities where VA offices that supported his disability, you know, were taken. And that meant he moved a lot. <clears throat> He ended up working, he worked here in Jackson, I think, first. Then he moved, he was in Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Houston, Texas, and finally, Los Angeles, which is where his work career ended. According to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, God gave Adam a job before he gave him a family. Hello. So Adam wasn't sitting there playing video games. Uh, <clears throat> He was told, Adam was told, to dress and keep the garden. The word dress, Hebrew word abad, means work, till the soil, 
the word keep, the, the uh, Hebrew word shamar means watch and take charge over and protect. And I pray that our young relatives will follow Dad's example of being diligent to work. There are many who are looking for a way to get on the disability rolls when they're not even sick. He was determined to work. Number three, Dad was a generous giver. As Jesus said in Matthew 8, beginning at verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, skipping to verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Dad gave to charities. One such charity is a charity called Doctors Without Borders. Some of you may have heard of it. This is an independent, impartial medical humanitarian agency that provides health care in places where it's lacking and responds to emergency disease outbreaks for people who are poor and don't have the ability to pay for the um, care that they're receiving. Dad felt God was using these people to minister health care to the poor of the world, and he gave money to show his appreciation for what they were doing. We do the same thing when we give to our local church in appreciation for the things that are done in the church the things that are being done to make new disciples, uh, to, to provide spiritual guidance to children, to provide deliverance from captive souls, and so many other things. Because offerings are given to those who believe that, that um, to those who believe are doing what God is using them to do, it can be considered a heavenly offering, even those sent to a human agency. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16 says, don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Now, money isn't the only thing we can give. We can give time. We can give time to sow into pe changing people's lives um, and seeing people uh, renewed and recovered from dangers, you know, habits, addictions, and things that ensnare our souls. Now, that time can't be restored back to you once you've sown that time. You can, you can, if you spend money, you can get more money. But once time is gone, it's gone. But it can cause the time that you have left to provide a more satisfying fulfillment to your life. Number four, Dad was a disciplined money manager. He saved money well because of his ability to avoid the bad habits of using high interest rate credit cards and neighborhood high interest rate lending companies that only happen in our neighborhoods. He paid cash for his house. He paid cash for his vehicles. He paid cash for his other big ticket items that he owned. He could not have done that if he had not managed his money well. Uh, Elder, um, Elder Smith was there when he bought his last house. Because, um, now, I didn't do that when I started out <laughs> in my career. <laughs> I remember uh, maxing out the Sears credit card just to go to work. You know, I was working in Thomastown and going up the highway 60 miles, and uh, they sold gas. You know, I stuck my card in there every time I needed some until the car wouldn't work no more. But, you know, um, I came to this church, and this church taught us to build an emergency fund, glory to God. And an emergency fund that will pay our expenses in the case that there was an interruption in our cash flow. Because I followed that, I was able to maintain my lifestyle when I was let go from my job in August 2022. And to live from then until February 2023 with all my expenses paid. Proverbs 21.20 says, There's a treasure to be desired, and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish spends it all up. In other words, wise ones discipline themselves to save until later the valuable things that come their way. But, foolish, but the foolish ones use up everything they get and live in lack. Number five, and this is the last one. My dad was determined to learn. As a young boy, he had to work for a sharecropper who I believe was um, 
you know, performing a racist act against him. When he was finally enrolled in school at age 11, most of us went at, at age six. He didn't get to go till age 11. The landlord would see him walking on his way to work, or to school, and he would demand that he go out in the field and remove grass. And so he would ask him, you know, can I do that after school? And he said, no, go do it right now. As a result, he missed many days from school. But just like Frederick Douglass, if you've ever read about him, dad had a friend named Clyde. And when they got finished playing basketball on the court, Clyde would take a stick and show him how to do mathematic problems in the dirt, glory to God. That was a friend. <clears throat> After the Korean War, the GI Bill helped veterans get an education, so dad went to Jackson College for teachers, which is now Jackson State. But for some reason, he didn't finish. So dad bought English books and social studies books. They're still over there at the house. Then he used those to read and supplement his education. And it prepared him well for the government regulations he was going to have to read at the VA hospital. <laughs> when I would come to his house, I would see him reading the local newspaper and current events magazines to keep himself abreast of things that were going on. Now, hear this scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. You may say that scripture is for teachers, for, just for preachers. No. All it says is study to show yourself approved. It doesn't say just study the Bible. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Though this was sent from a preacher to a preacher, it applies to anyone that needs to learn how to correctly do a task or work, you know, to practice a learned skill. To perform that skill well, you need to study. Amen. Amen. I'm encouraging the younger ones to follow Dad's example and anyone that wants to adopt any of these principles. In using the title, message title, Keep Going, I pray that these five things will become part of future McClellan lives, but in anyone else that wants to embrace them. As a legacy, taken from dad's example. In other words, as part of my keep going message, I am saying keep these wise practices going. Amen. Now, um, I want to share part of the journey that happened to me and show you how God, how awesome God is in bringing us through what um, we must face. Um, there are other areas in my dad's life I want to talk, briefly mention where he's left a good example is in his health. He was always reading health books. And uh, anytime he had a sprain, an inflammation, you know, headache, heartburn, whatever, he read up on how to treat it without medication. He used, uh, he had a book that said using food as medicine. Uh, and he would constantly tell us, you know, to eat this and try that and, you know, put this in your this and, you know, to make sure that um, we were listening to his teachings. But here's an example of something unusual. I went to his house one day and there was a machine on the floor and I said, what is this? And he got up, laid down on the machine and did sit-ups in his 80s. And then he told me when he finished, he said, um, I had back trouble. This helped relieve my back pain. <laughs> At 80, I don't know 80 what, but I just know he was in his 80s. Another thing he did, um, he was going to the doctor and he had inflammation in his prostate area. And the doctor said, if you come back and this condition is still there, we're gonna put you on medication. He did not wanna be on that medication. So he went and found a book that told him um, something he could do to reduce the swelling. Tomato paste. Tomato paste. He ate the tomato paste. I don't know how many cans. You have to, look, you have to Google that yourself. <laughs> but it did take cans, not just one. But when he went back to that doctor, he wasn't swollen. Amen. He was always doing that. He was always bouncing back from things that attacked him. 
you know, from things that happened to his body. And, you know, when, um, when he asked me to move in with him in 2022, you know, at first I was trying to, you know, protect my independence. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of stay free, you know, using my apartment, you know, until my job ran out. <clears throat> my job ran out in August of 2022. And so I said, well, I'll work. You know, uh, I started out, my first and beginning of my career was, um, I was teaching high school. And so I said, well, I'll just go back to that. But um, the computer made me lazy. You know, the computer does all the calculations for you, you know, so you don't know how to do them anymore. You just get on the computer and do them. And um, when I said I was going to go and start tutoring, I went and picked up a math book, and I didn't even get some of them problems right. <laughs> so I needed to go through some training. Everything that I tried to go into required some training, and it had a price tag that went outside of my budget of my, um, uh, you know, my account of trying to preserve with no paycheck, you know, my emergency fund. So I finally got a clue that God was telling me the message, go move in with your dad. <laughs> but then when I thought about it, knowing that he bounced back every time, he, the reason he asked me to move in is he said, I'm getting forgetful about some things, and I don't know what I'll do, you know, so I need somebody to be with me. And, um, you know, first what I did is I started going to see him every day. I said, well, maybe that'll, that'll, that'll come. In. But once, once, I got the, once I got the message, um, then I, I was eager to move in because I knew God is going to do some things in this. God is going to do some things in this. So God answered a lot of prayers. He solved a lot of our problems for both of us um, as I stayed with him. Yeah, we butt heads, as humans do. Um, we had to work through conflicts, seek peaceful resolutions, and avoid hot-button topics that was going to bring an argument. Pick your battles. <laughs> but... But all things worked together for good when we were together. On March the 1st, we had to take Dad to the hospital because he couldn't walk. You know, he had asked me to come and bring him up to get a hip, help him get to the bathroom, which was unusual, but he had done that before. And um, I took him, helped him, walked him to the bathroom. But on the way back, he couldn't move that right leg. And so I had to give him a place to sit until I could get him back to the bed with some rolling, you know, uh, device. So I decided, no, he gonna need to go to the hospital and find out why, because he was walking yesterday. So the doctors, when he got to the hospital, the VA hospital, they, uh, they told us that he had stopped taking some of his daily medication, and that was the cause. So they gave a, a intravenous, um, injection for um, the daily medications that he was taking while he was in the hospital. But they also found a heart condition that he was diagnosed with back in 2023, which made it hard, 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 H-E-R-D, for his heart, you know, to, to put the blood through his body. Now, I was praying about all these conditions. I was seeing God answer prayers left and right, you know, when I was living with him. Um, but as fast as one thing would get solved, two more would show up. And he was becoming more and more helpless every day. My constant prayer for my dad was the peace of God in his heart, the peace of God in his environment, wherever he was, whether he was at home, whether he was in, a, in the car, riding with somebody. He had, he had given up driving, which was wise, you know. He had given up cooking. He didn't want to leave the stove on, you know, and burn up some food or maybe have gas in the house, you know, so he gave up cooking. And um, he did a lot of things to protect himself, which was very wise. Um, and so 
my constant prayer was for him to have peace and to have soundness of mind. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind to, 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 to counteract the effects of senility and dementia. A sound mind, I prayed over my daddy every day. Many times I would see God answer those prayers right before my eyes. He had hallucinations, and he would be shouting at somebody that wasn't in the room. And I might be laying in my bed saying, Lord, I, I speak peace over my dad. I speak peace over this environment. I speak soundness to his mind and holiness to his body in Jesus' name. And I would say that until that voice died down in this room. On March the 9th at 6.36 p.m., I received a call that he had died in the hospital. I had just left there about 3.45. I knew that things that we had asked the hospital not to do, don't resuscitate, don't do anything invasive, was going to limit the kind of treatment that they were going to give him. They were going to have to send him home. And so I said, well, let me go to the house and start getting things together. They'll probably send him next week. And little did I know he wouldn't be coming home. Now, before his death, I would always ask him, was he in pain? You know, and he usually wasn't. It was only, and if he was, he'd tell you, you know, um, his, his, his right leg was the one that stopped being able to move, but it was his left leg that had the pain from time to time. Go figure. But that's a blessing that this man at 90 some years old was, was without pain most of the time. I know people that start with pain when they're 50 and keep that pain for the rest of their lives. The peace of God that I was praying over my dad, I just knew was going to be, I, I know that the peace of God is an atmosphere through which healing can flow because usually when anxiety and fear and worry blocks the flow of healing. The Bible says that in, um, uh, in one of Jesus' parables, he said, you know, uh, the cares of this life, deceitfulness of riches, it chokes the word of God and it does not produce. So that's why I was speaking peace over him. But that peace that I thought would help him heal, that peace was not for his physical bounce back that I was used to. It appears that it was there to help him let go because it was time to come rest. That wasn't what I was praying for. <laughs> that wasn't what I wanted the outcome to be of my prayers. Now, I knew he was getting tired and getting old, and he was losing himself. He could see that. His daily life on earth only brought more problems in his mind and body. But he said to both my brother and me, son, don't get old, remember? <laughs> I said, well, Dad, you know, the only alternative is to die young. Now, what you, is that what you want me to do? <laughs> but I never asked him that question. I wouldn't have asked him that question. All the time that I'd been with Dad, I knew my role. Um, I mean, I knew what I was there for. Um, I believe that the peace that he had showed him a new world apart from this one. Not because he didn't want to be with us, but because it was getting too hard for him to cope with conditions he was suffering with on this side. Dad knew, just like Job did, that if a man dies, he'll live again. Glory to God. And he also knew something Job didn't know. He knew the name of his redeemer, Jesus Christ. Job, Job knew he had a redeemer. He just didn't know his name. And dad called that name often in his prayers. But at his death, my question was, what about me? What about my family that was expecting him to live? I knew he was at peace. But his death left me with no feeling. 
No sadness, no peace, no hope, not lack of hope, but no feeling of hope, no anger, nothing. When I knew they were going to send him home, I knew it was going to be a lot of work, okay? I'm looking at the thing that the uh, nurses had on the wall in the hospital and I say, okay, they turned him every two hours. Okay, I noticed how many times they came in to change him. I noticed how many times they had to feed him. You know, I, I say, okay, I'm geared, getting geared up for the work that I'm about to be responsible for. And then he's gone. And I went from way up here, high gear, all the way down to the floor, just like that, and felt nothing. At some point, I realized that Jesus' disciples must have had the same kind of experience when Jesus died. Wouldn't you think? Like me, they experienced a drastic change. Jesus' disciples weren't expecting him to die, even though he told them. He said, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again the third day. And they're like, okay, now what figurative thing could that mean other than actual physical death? What do y'all think, you know? Everything except facing exactly what he said. When he died, the disciples, like me, had no more role in his life as far as they knew. He's going, he died, he's going to stay dead like everybody else. Even though he's raised people from the dead, they didn't have a clue. Then when Jesus did rise from the dead, they soon discovered that he was going back to, to heaven. And he told them to go. He wouldn't be there and going with them. Since he was not going to physically be traveling with them on earth, they were not optimistic about carrying out what he trained them to do. So in John chapter uh, 21, verse 3, and I'm going to share these verses, and the rest of this is going to be from John uh, 21. And I'll just paraphrase some of it rather than reading it. Peter said the words, I'm going fishing. And the disciples said, we're going to. So he went out, entered the ship, and that night he didn't catch anything. And so my question was, why did he go fishing? Well, that's what he was doing before he came to Jesus. It was his, that was his livelihood. That's how he supported his family. So, you know, since I'm not going to do this, what Jesus was teaching us to do, let me, let me go and see how the fishing business is going. But was that working for him? No. But also, what wasn't working is the ministry that Jesus gave him. Like the disciples, I tried to get involved doing something to take my mind off, you know, his death, um, dad's death. So I started working with the family, organizing things, getting ready for, for this occasion, as well as getting dad had requested to be cremated. And so we started working the procedures, uh, the steps to get that done. But it appears that nothing that we did progressed over several days. You know, there was paperwork that was holding up everything. And like them, I'm seeing no fruit of the stuff that I'm sowing my time into. The disciples' failed fishing trip added to their misery, just like me. So I'm seeing this pattern. This is teaching me how to bounce back myself. I'm not going to do it, but God is going to do it in me. When the morning came, Jesus, disciples, Jesus said to his disciples, did you catch anything? They said no. And so he told them something he had told them before. Throw your net on the right side. <laughs> in other words, not the wrong side. <laughs> At his instruction, they did, and they caught 153 fish. But here's the thing. When they came to shore, Jesus had already prepared food. He didn't need that fish. And then he sat down with Peter and he asked him a question. He said, do you love me? The, in the upper room, Peter had said, uh, Jesus, first of all, Jesus told all his disciples, he's, you know, things that were going to happen to him, like I said a minute ago. And then he said, all of you will be offended tonight. And so Peter said, I'm not, not me, not me. These might, but not me, you know. And he, he, he said, I'll die for you. 
self-sacrificial love. I got that agape. And so Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And he said, no, not me. And the other disciples said the same thing. So when Jesus is sitting there asking him, do you love me? He uses that word agape. Do you self-sacrificially love me like you say you did in the upper room before you didn't when you were denying me? <laughs> and Peter had to be honest and say, Lord, I phileo you. Phileo is a, is a Greek word that the word Philadelphia has that word in it. And we know Philadelphia to be the city of the brotherly love with the highest crime rate in that part of the country. Um, so phileo was, he was honest and say, I have phileo love for you. Jesus asked him again. He asked him three times because he denied him three times. He asked him, do you agape me? He said, Lord, I phileo you. So Jesus came to that level and said, do you phileo me? He said, Lord, you know all things. I phileo you. Each time he answered, regardless to whether he said phileo, you know, whether Jesus said agape or phileo, he still instructed Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He didn't say, no, since you don't love me right, you don't, you ain't, you're not going to handle my people. No, phileo, even if you phileo me, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Now, in all of this instruction, he told them to go. We saw that in Matthew 28. Go ye and therefore teach all nations. He just told Peter to feed. But they ain't doing none of that. When Jesus shows up after he rose from the dead, he appears or, you know, he walks up, you know, because he ain't got to walk no more. <laughs> like, like he did when he was, um, you know, walking with them as a human. So after he did what he did, he would go on about his business, and that would leave them free to do whatever they should be doing. But they weren't doing what he said. So when the disciples, even though he told them to go, they weren't going. So were they just being disobedient to his instruction? No, they weren't. Jesus told his disciples that they were witnesses of his resurrection. Him, them and the ladies that went to, uh, to, uh, to prepare his body on that morning, the resurrection morning. The resurrection is a spiritual work that's required in spiritual minds to understand it, the message that they're going to carry. They needed the anointing of the Spirit of God to empower the preaching of that message. So when we say, when he said go, go is not just moving from one place to the other. Go is carrying everything I put in you so you can do what you got to do when you get where you're going. So when we say keep going, it's not just keep moving. It's keep carrying what I put in you. Jesus has taught his disciples once, just like me, once they got to that point of his death, all of that just, you got to go back and get what I put in you beforehand to be prepared to move forward. And he also gave them this word in Luke chapter um, 24, verse 49. I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem. Don't go nowhere tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And then he followed that up in Acts 1 8 and said but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses unto me in all the world. So they needed that power. They weren't disobedient. They were waiting for what Jesus was going to send to them. Like the disciples the work that my family and I were doing, trying to organize and set up everything, we planned 
We plan to set a date for this service um, when we receive the death certificate. We ended up waiting 12 days for that. Um, friends and relatives asking us, what's the date for the service? We don't know. We didn't even know it was a blockage. And as I attempted to write this message you're hearing right now, I, re I experienced writer's block so many times. Tear it up and start a new one. Read that, say, this is it, you know, read over it again, tear that up and start a new one. It was then the Lord led me to go and study the struggle the disciples had when Jesus rose from the dead. Well, Jesus didn't raise up my dad from the dead. But he did lead me to apply those principles of the disciples and the things that they went through to find the guidance of how to move forward in the preparation for this service and completion of the message. I needed to look at what God did for the disciples in their similar situation to strengthen my faith to carry out the effort of ministering to those who are present today and to all who will hear this by, um, by video. I gained the assurance from the Lord that the Spirit of God would be at work in this room this morning, glory to God, ministering his comfort, peace, hope, and even joy to the worshipers that are here today. I noticed that on the day, before the day of Pentecost, Jesus speaking to Peter, he said something after he told him, feed my sheep. He told him, Peter, when you were young, you would dress yourself and you'd get up and go wherever you wanted to go. But Peter, when you get old one day, somebody else is going to dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And the next scripture said, this signifying what death Peter would glorify God with. Now, if anything, the next thing Jesus said after he told him that is, follow me. The next thing I would have been doing is leaving him. <laughs> but telling me that I'm going to die like you died. But he had put enough in him with that encounter to give him the will. Before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon him to be willing to continue following, to receive that Holy Spirit. My problem wasn't that I was afraid of public speaking. My problem was I lost heart. at the sudden death of my dad. And I began to expect to be able to do spiritual things with mere human strength, which just don't work. The natural man understands not the things of the Spirit of God. The carnal man doesn't either. Both the disciples and I had to recover things that we left behind. Let me share with you what those things are. We needed to go back to purpose that God had been revealing to us to help us accomplish his will in our lives and the lives of people that we got to minister to. We had to accomplish, recover conviction, which is the persuasion of the truth, that the things that we're supposed to do can be done in spite of our disappointment. We had to recover vision of what God has been given to us for the next steps that need to be made to respond in taking those steps from vision. We had to recover passion as as uh, that we had when God was using us before the things, uh, when things were going well. God is still on the throne. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And we don't have to worry about anything that we're facing the same way you saw successful victories in the past. He who did those victories is still around to do victories in your future. We need to recover the inspiration that provided the fuel for new ideas and methods of seeing people blessed and obstacles overcome and problems solved and the enemy defeated. We need to recover, and I needed to recover, the fullness of the Spirit to enable me to be directed and empowered by God to help those who are mourning dad's death with me and needing to receive healing of the pain of losing him. There's no power in my flesh to produce the spiritual balm that will bring healing to the soul. I'm not expecting it, not from my flesh. But God hears and answers prayer, and he cares about the griefs and sorrows that we carry in our lives. He promises to provide comfort, hope, and peace to those affected 
by the troubles and the sorrows of the world we live in. So to my family, please know that dad was at peace. Not because I prayed, but because God is a God of peace. He had times of struggle, but he came back to the peace of God. He enjoyed the blessings of not being in constant pain throughout his senior years, and I hope that my genes got all of that I need. God's message, I believe, to you and to me is keep going. Going how? Going to those here on earth who need you, who needed you before he died and who need you now. Whether it's relatives, friends, co-workers, people in your life. Don't lose heart or lose sight of the valuable purpose God has given each of you. If you sense yourself feeling useless and lacking meaning, remember that Remember who made you. <laughs> he ain't made nothing without meaning and purpose. And the abilities that he's given you and the people that those abilities have already helped, and they told you how much that you helped them, that came from God. And the fact that you're still here, the fact that you're not finished, or you wouldn't be here that we got more work to do. Keep going. Doing what you're here for. Fulfilling purpose. And let God energize it and take it to the next level. So I want to pray for my family and all who are here. As you allow yourself to be happy for dad's joy, and his freedom right now. Let him heal you of the pain of the loss so the memories that you can have will be sweet. After the prayer, we're going to sing a song with the choir and um, prepare to end the service. But And uh, then Pastor Steve will give us the benediction. But would everyone stand so that I can pray? For those who in the family as well as well wishes who are here, I thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Heavenly Father, I pray for our fam my family and for this family of believing people. I pray for the well wishes also that came to celebrate your home, the home going of my dad. I speak peace to them as they face future days. I speak peace to my family as they face future days with our dad here with us. I pray the comfort of your spirit be upon them as you carry out your ministry of comfort in those who mourn and look to you for hope. By your anointing, God, I pray that you would heal hearts that are broken with disappointment over dad's passing. Help them in time to exchange beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and let them know that you're sowing and planting trees of righteousness, bringing glory to you. Let them be made free from Satan's weapons of despair. As they receive the freedom, let them pay it forward by providing comfort to somebody else who might fall under the same attack of the same weapons that the enemy sent against us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I'm living this life. I'm living this life just to live my yeah. And with the Lord. And with the Lord, I know that I shall pray. I shall not stray. I shall not stray. I'll stay. He'll welcome his children. Children home one day, like a deep in the night, like a deep in the night.
even the night he shall return for me. That's the day that he'll come. That's the day that he'll come and fly away. You see, Jesus, Jesus will welcome me. Oh, 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 oh. oh I shall see him. I shall see him for myself. I shall meet him. I shall meet him. God, everybody. What a wonderful tribute to a great man of God. And thank you, Elder John, for the way you honored your father. And we've all been blessed. I feel like I know him now because I heard about him from your heart. And uh, we wanted to make the announcement that the uh, signing book is ready for everybody to sign on your way out. Um, it will be back in the foyer. And thank you for that as well. And um, I just wanted to let you know that Pastor, our Pastor Jennifer Beard wanted to be here today, but she had a prior engagement that she could not cancel. So she's, uh, her love is here. She sends her love and prayers and support for the family. So if you don't mind one more time, if we could stand together, we'll close in a word of prayer together. Uh, this wonderful message, keep going. It's an inspiration to all of us. Don't stop for anything. We're not of those that draw back, but we're of those that believe to the saving of the soul. It, it makes me think of a definition of a winner that God gave, me to, gave to me. Uh, a winner is not someone who never loses, but someone who never quits. Just don't give up, and you're a winner. Give up. Keep your eyes on the one who has his eyes on you. And know that he's always going to be for you. Let your life shine for him and keep going no matter what. Because the reward will be great. And one day there will be no separation. And I look forward to that wonderful day. 
Could we pray together, please? Lord, thank you for this wonderful tribute to a great man of God. And Lord, thank you for Elder John and his family. Let them feel continuously your strength, your peace, your help, and your support in every way that's needed, Lord. Just like you have your arms around this precious man of God right now, put your arms around the family and let them feel that strength that only you can give. And we thank you, Lord, that you're always more than enough. No matter how difficult the time is, God, thank you that you're more than enough to bring comfort and healing and encouragement and hope to live with all of the heart and with all of the mind and all of the days that you've given them, Lord, to serve you and to live for you with joy, looking forward to that great day when everything will be made right. And God, we thank you for the life that we can live now and the life that's to come. Let the blessings and the favor rest upon this family and these these uh, these visitors, Lord, and family and friends that have come to make this a special time of tribute. God, we thank you for the blessings of God flowing continuously over their lives. And God, we give you all the praise and we commit this time together and the days that are ahead with your strength and peace into your precious hands for the glory of God. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Hey, keep going on, 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 keep going on. Don't you ever quit your keep going on. Oh,